My pleasure and privilege to be here with you this evening. Um, some of you might have been wondering if you were in the right place before you heard Ken's introductory remar remarks, because indeed, the person you were promised doesn't quite look like me anymore. <laughs> and this is a live demonstration of thermodynamics in action. Entropy will always increase, right? You see the sacrifices speakers make to come and give presentations like this. So it's kind of an unusual topic for a creation presentation. Um, there are some topics that are commonly uh, discussed and others that are perhaps less frequent. Uh, I argue, though, that this is a fruitful area for us to investigate. The Bible tells us that the heavens declare the glory of God, which makes astronomy unique among the sciences, if you think about it, because there's a promise here of a reward that if we investigate the heavens, we will gain a better appreciation for God's glory. But what about the other sciences? I mean, the Bible is largely silent about other topics within science. Well, although this promise isn't explicitly given, modern areas of scientific inquiry, I believe, hold the same promise. For example, within biology, the bewildering complexity of what happens inside of a cell, the software engineering principles inside of DNA, Molecular machines made of proteins. Some of the complexity here is still beyond our understanding as to how it even works. So wonderful things happening within biology and allows us to appreciate the Lord's glory as an engineer, if you will. Chemistry proclaims God's glory. Right, Ken? <laughs> even within chemistry, studying the properties of individual elements and atoms, um, even to the point where some unbelievers have expressed wonder at it. Uh, Sir Fred Hoyle, for example, not a friend of creationism by any stretch of the imagination, but he said that a super intellect must have monkeyed with physics and chemistry just from the properties of the carbon atom that he th found so amazing. Paleontology preserves for us a record of some of the wondrous creatures that the Lord created, many of which aren't around anymore, of course. but. The fact that they are preserved for us allows us to appreciate his abilities as designer. Geology preserves for us a record of some of the Lord's interactions with humankind, his holiness, and the judgment implicit in Noah's flood. And even the more narrowly focused sciences, like ornithology, for example, you could argue proclaims God's glory. You could do multiple presentations just on how amazing birds are. I mean, the iridescence of feathers, the design of their bodies for flight, some of the specific features that specific species have. Wonderful things here. So all of these sciences help us to understand the Lord's glory more. But what about physics? Does physics proclaim the glory of God? Not a topic that's typically discussed, right? Well, my point tonight is that it does. Specifically, the laws of thermodynamics. Other aspects, aspects of physics do as well, but this is my focus here tonight. So what is thermodynamics anyway? Well, thermo means heat. Dynamics means change or motion. So thermodynamics literally means the change in heat or the motion of heat. And there are several laws of thermodynamics. I'm going to focus this evening on two of them. The first law of thermodynamics and the second. So let's, let's say what they are first and then we'll come back and talk about that. So the first law says that matter and energy cannot be created or destroyed. We'll talk later about why that's important for origins. And the second law of thermodynamics you may have heard says that entropy in a closed system will always increase. Now, what exactly does that mean? Well, we'll revisit this and discuss that further. But these are the two laws that I'm going to be focusing on in this presentation. We'll talk about what they are, how they work, and their implications for the creation issue. And we'll also talk about some other ideas surrounding this that various people have proposed. For example, you may have heard that perhaps the fall of man is when the second law of thermodynamics was introduced into the world that the curse that was placed on the creation as a result of Adam's sin is manifested in the second law of thermodynamics. Does that, is that a good idea? Does that uh, hold up as we look at it further? Well, that is one topic we'll be discussing among a larger group of misconceptions that where people are misapplying arguments from thermodynamics when it comes to origins. And it's not just one side. Both sides of the creation versus evolution debate are doing this. There's a lot of incorrect arguments going around. So we're going to correct some of those because we don't want to make arguments that aren't valid. However, correctly understood, thermodynamics does provide a variety of valid arguments for us. For example, thermodynamics, when we really look, look at it and apply it to astronomy, indicates that our solar system is young and isn't billions of years old. It shows that life requires an intelligent designer. 
It shows that any non-creationary model of origins for the universe is self-refuting. It contradicts itself. And thus, it confirms that a supernatural creator must be responsible for the fact that we have a universe today. So here's an outline of how we're going to cover all that. We are going to start with by uh, listing a few misconceptions, a few of the incorrect arguments that I mentioned. We won't dig into them in depth, but we'll introduce them um, at first. Then we'll talk about how the first and second laws of thermodynamics actually work. And this goes back to the 1800s in terms of when uh, scientists began to understand all of this. Once we know what, what they are and how they work, we will then be able to apply them to origins. We'll see that there's multiple implications for origins implicit in those two laws. And having been equipped then, at that point, we will revisit the misconceptions and show why they don't actually work and shouldn't be used in the way that they often are. Then we'll cover valid arguments you can make from thermodynamics. Um, thermodynamics can be used to show those things I mentioned earlier. And having gotten to that point, we will then revisit the laws and talk not only about how they work, but why they work. And this was uh, actually reflecting the chronology and history because how they work was known in the 1800s, but why they do that wasn't really known until the early 1900s. And once we're equipped with that information, we will then be able to see additional implications for origins. Now that sounds like quite a list, <laughs> so we better get started. So let's start by listing a few misconceptions. The second law of thermodynamics is often expressed with the sentence, entropy in a closed system will always increase. But what exactly is entropy? Well, many people will say it's disorder, disorganization, so that a system will always get more disorganized over time. And you can even have some fun with this as this, uh, <laughs> Little child here says, I blame entropy for the condition of my bedroom. But is entropy really disorganization? How do you quantify that? I mean, if, if I look at this garage, I can, measure its, I can measure the temperature of that room, right, with a thermometer. I can measure the atmospheric pressure with a barometer. What instrument would I use to measure the disorder? The, your wife. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you to whoever said that. Um, yeah, unfortunately, that's not a universally applicable metric that everybody agrees on. But my point is, disorganization and disorder is a very subjective um, value, right? And it may vary from one person to the other. One person can be perfectly comfortable in a room where someone else is pulling their hair out, for those of us who have hair to pull out. So entropy is not actually disorganization. It is a specific thing in physics. We'll talk later about what exactly that is. But my point is we shouldn't call it disorder because that leads actually to incorrect arguments. And even some prominent creationists have made some arguments that aren't really correct. For example, uh, Drs. Whitcomb and Morris, uh, giants within the creation movement, they said that creation, or whatever biologists imply by evolution, actually has been accomplished by means of creative processes, which are now replaced by the deteriorative processes implicit in the second law. So you see, they're saying the second law means deterioration. The latter are probably a part of the curse placed upon the earth as a result of the entrance of sin, Genesis 3, the bondage of decay to which it has been subjected by God for the present age. So you see they're saying entropy is a deterioration over time, and that all started when the curse was placed upon the world. You, that's an incorrect argument, though, as we will see shortly. You may also have heard people say that evolution is impossible because it's a decrease in entropy that you can't go from simple forms of life to more complex forms of life because that would mean entropy is going backwards. Well, again, entropy is not merely a matter of complexity or order, and so this is actually a bad argument. An informed evolutionist, if you make this claim, will correctly point out that even if evolution were a decrease in entropy, it still would be allowed because the sun is beaming energy upon the earth, therefore the sun's increase in entropy can more than compensate for a slight decrease in entropy represented by the evolution of life. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying evolution is possible. There's many reasons why neo-Darwinian processes don't work and can't explain how you could get from molecules to man. But we should make, all the arguments we make against that should be correct ones, and this one is not correct. So we shouldn't use it. Dr. Dwayne Gish, another giant within the creation movement, used to debate evolutionists um, for a number of years until they learned they shouldn't debate him because they always lost. Um, but he said, this fundamental law of science tells us that an isolated or closed system 
will never increase in order and complexity. It will never become more highly organized. So again, you see he was saying entropy means an increase in disorder and disorganization. And because this is not a valid argument, at least one of his opponents actually scored a point against him in a debate uh, where the opponent held up a bottle of salad dressing, he shook it so it was all mixed, and then he said, look, before your very eyes, this salad dressing is separating into oil and vinegar. It's becoming more ordered. He said, so this disproves the claim that Dr. Gish just, Gish just made. So you see, by making an incorrect argument, it allowed the other side to score points in a debate. So again, we should only use correct arguments. I've also heard uh, evolutionists say that crystal formation re represents an increase in order and complexity. Therefore, creationist claims about the second law of thermodynamics aren't correct. And one even went so far as to use the growth of a child to refute uh, alleged creationist claims. This author said, can a few cells floating around in a warm liquid turn into something complex? Clearly, a material can acquire a complex form because you go from an embryo to a baby, right? That's an increase in complexity for sure. So any claim that some law forbids it is a false claim. So hopefully you understand my point here. We need to make sure that all the arguments we use are correct. We have plenty of correct ones to use that the other side can't answer. But by using incorrect ones, they appear to be able to answer our claims, and that's not a good thing. So we'll revisit these later once we're a little better equipped to understand the ins and outs of how all of this works. So let's talk about that next. How do the first and second laws of thermodynamics work? Well, let's take a little visit back into history and ask the question, what is thermodynamics and where did this whole subject come from? It actually arose, in a sense, from coal mining, especially in Great Britain in the 1700s and 1800s. Great Britain is blessed with an abundance of coal deposits. As a result, they had an abundance of cheap and easily mineable coal. And so the early steam engines, uh, which were very inefficient, nevertheless worked very well in Great Britain because if you had a lot of cheap coal, it didn't matter how much of it you had to shovel in, you had plenty more where that came from. And so this um, powered, if you will, the Industrial Revolution, especially in Great Britain, where factories sprang up all over the place, powered by steam engines, all powered by cheap coal. Now over on the continent, the continent of Europe, uh, other governments were very much interested in getting into this bounty, especially in the manufacturing of textiles, where lots of money was being made. But they didn't have such cheap, abundant coal as Great Britain did. So they had to dig a little deeper into how steam engines work, why do they work, and more importantly, how can they be made to work more efficiently? So, so scientists really started digging into this area of inquiry, which forced them to grapple with the more basic question, what is heat anyway? Heat powers a steam engine, but if you don't know what heat is, you can't make the steam engine work better. Their understanding at the time was, was not quite correct. Well, actually, some of the early ideas were very incorrect. Uh, the modern theory of heat is called the kinetic theory. We now understand that when you heat a material, it causes its atoms and molecules to vibrate more. So the hotter material gets, the more vibration is happening within this material. And if you have two chunks of material where one is hotter than the other, when you place them in contact, in thermal contact, as it's called, then the some of the vibration can transfer from the more energetic one to the lesser energetic one until they are both equal. So heat transfers from the hotter object to the colder object. And that also means that uh, thermal energy can transfer only if there is a difference in temperature between the two objects that are being spoken of. Now you may wonder where I'm going with all this. Well, there's actually implications for origins inherent in that statement. It means that, among other things, small bodies are going to cool off faster than larger bodies. Why is that? Well, if you have two steel balls and the balls are both the same temperature, I'm going to represent that here, the red color, and they're uniform temperature inside themselves. Now, a moment ago, we saw that you can only transfer heat when there's a difference in temperature. So molecules inside of the ball are surrounded by molecules of the same temperature, so there can be no heat transfer there, right? Work is the only place heat transfer can happen, right on the skin, you know, the very outermost layer of material on one of these objects. Because this material has a cooler environment compared to the, the temperature it's at, so heat can indeed go out. Whereas the smaller body, 
with the same thickness of outer material, these, the yellow circles here are actually the same size, it's a bit of an optical illusion, but you see how the material that can lose and transfer heat away from itself is a higher percentage of volume for the smaller body than the larger body, right? Thus, smaller bodies can cool off faster than larger ones. Why is that significant? Well, we can apply that, for example, to the solar system. Large planets, like the gas giant planets, for example, can retain heat for a long time because they're, they're very large bodies. Smaller bodies, though, are going to lose heat much more quickly. And if the solar system were actually four and a half billion years old, there's a lot of small bodies that should have cooled off billions of years ago, but apparently haven't done so yet. For example, our moon. Small body should have cooled off a long time ago. Nevertheless, there's a growing amount of evidence that the moon is still volcanically active. Uh, there's been evidence for a while of gas venting from various places on the moon. More recent discoveries is that some of the faults we see on the moon are apparently still active, which means the moon is tectonically active. There's moonquakes going on, but moonquakes require geological energy. That should have all left a long time ago if the moon were actually billions of years old. But apparently it hasn't cooled off yet, which would imply it didn't form billions of years old ago after all. As this author said, the whole idea that a 4.6 billion year old rocky body like the moon has managed, somehow, to stay hot enough in the interior and produce this network, network of faults just flies in the face of conventional wisdom. I mean, this isn't complicated. Small things cool off quickly. But the moon apparently hasn't cooled off yet. We also see fresh volcanic deposits on the moon. Well, that means the moon's still volcanically active, which again it shouldn't be because it was supposed to have cooled off long ago. As this author said, this finding is the kind of science that is literally going to make geologists rewrite the textbooks about the moon. Now, if the moon were actually four and a half billion years old, give or take, this is a problem. It shouldn't still be active anymore. Now, if it's just thousands of years old, that's not a problem after all. It's still cooling off from its recent creation. And similar arguments apply elsewhere in the solar system. This is Io, one of the moons of Jupiter. Tiny little body, only one and a half percent of the mass of Earth yet it's the most volcanically active body in the solar system. We sometimes see eruptions blasting material 180 to 200 miles into space. Very active body. In fact, it's producing so much material that if it were actually four and a half billion years old, it would have recycled itself through its own volcanoes over 30 times, which doesn't sound like a reasonable supposition. But the point for tonight is, where is the heat coming from to power all of this volcanic activity? Well, a little bit of it is coming from tidal energy, tidal flexing specifically, where Jupiter's on one side and some of the other moons are on the other, and so Io's caught in like a gravitational tug of war, so it's being squeezed and flexed. And that does actually impart a small amount of heat into the moon, but it can't account for all of the, ge the geological activity that we see happening. So the logical explanation is that this is primordial heat left over from its formation. Now, if that formation was just a few thousand years ago, that's not a problem. It's still cooling off from its recent creation. If that were four and a half billion years ago, then this is a problem. It doesn't make sense. Moving out in the solar system, we have uh, one of Saturn's moons called Enceladus, a pretty little moon. It reflects back into space almost all of the sunlight that it receives. And our first photographs of Enceladus were kind of intriguing. This is, these are Saturn's rings here. The spacecraft was almost edge on to the rings at the time. And I don't know if it's dark enough in here to see. There's a little smudge below Enceladus here. Closer up photos, with false colors added especially, reveal Enceladus is blasting out geysers of water and ice from a region by its south pole. Well, that requires a lot of heat to boil this material and spray it out like that. What is powering this process? Well, again, secular scientists want to say it's tidal flexing from a gravitational tug of war going on around it. Uh, problem with that is, number one, it doesn't actually match the temperature distribution that we observe on Enceladus. And number two, it could only account for a few percent of the amount of energy required for this process to be happening. So again, if Enceladus was only a few thousand years old, this is not a problem. It's still cooling off from its creation. If it's billions of years old, then this is a problem. And the last body I'll talk about is Pluto. We could talk for a half hour just on Pluto alone, some of the amazing discoveries made there. But the one I'll focus on this evening, you notice there's these large areas here. Turns out Pluto has large areas where it has been resurfaced by its equivalent of volcanic activity. I say equivalent because this isn't uh, 
lava as it would be on Earth, it's other materials. But it's the same basic idea that there's plutonic volcanism flooding the surface with this material. And this happened recently, apparently, because this whole surface is smooth. There hasn't been enough time for craters to form in it yet, which means it must have happened very recently. Now, we know Pluto has received impacts because there's craters down here, for example, but this is all smooth, and then in transition areas, there's some craters that are partially filled in. So Pluto had craters, but then this equivalent of volcanic activity flooded the surface and filled them all in, and now this whole section of the surface is smooth. Now, this was totally unexpected by secular scientists because Pluto is very far out in the solar system, doesn't receive much energy from the sun, doesn't have much inherent in heat from radioactive decay because we know it doesn't have much radioactive elements within it, and that tidal flexing explanation that I mentioned earlier isn't available at Pluto because it has no, um, none of that flexing going on in its interaction with its primary moon, Charon. Therefore, Pluto should have no source of heat to be doing this if it were billions of years old, but it is apparently doing it, and for that matter, it might even still be doing it for all we know. As the scientist said in a NASA press conference, this could be only a week old for all we know. It looks that young and fresh. Pluto is still geologically active, but the only potential source of heat to be doing this is primordial heat left over from its formation. So again, if that was just a few thousand years ago, that explains what we see. But as one of the senior NASA scientists on the project said, finding that Pluto is geologically active after four and a half billion years, there's not a big enough typeface to write that in. It's unbelievable. Yes, because this shouldn't be happening if it were actually billions of years old. So we see the thermodynamics actually can be applied in some ways that wouldn't necessarily be obvious and produce some interesting implications for origins. Let's now talk about the first law of thermodynamics and see what that can tell us about origins. Now, in its classical form, the first law was primarily focused on heat energy, and scientists understood that you couldn't produce heat energy from nothing, nor could you actually destroy it. And as I mentioned, long understood, I mean, if you wanted your train to move, you had to shovel coal into the furnace and burn it, right? That energy doesn't pop into existence out of the air. It has to come from, in this case, the chemical energy stored in the coal. Subsequent to that, uh, scientists have now broadened their understanding of this law, and it's now con called the conservation of matter and energy, where the combined amount of matter and energy in the universe is conserved. It never changes. So you can change the relative amount of each, convert one to the other, but if one goes up, the other has to go down so that the total amount is always the same. What do I mean you can change them back and forth? Well, physics now understands that matter and energy have an equivalence expressed by the equation which you might have heard of, E equals mc squared. So E stands for energy, m stands for mass, the amount of matter, or physical stuff that you have, and then c is the speed of light, which is a very large number. So this equation tells us that a little bit of stuff can be converted into a large amount of energy. And the most efficient way we know how to do that is a nuclear explosion. A little bit of stuff converts into a large amount of energy, right? We can go the other direction. We can convert a lot of energy into a little bit of stuff, and we do that in particle accelerators. Little chunks of matter get zipping around and close to the speed of light, smash them together, more stuff comes out of the collisions than, than went in. Not just the number of particles, but the amount of physical matter. But are we creating matter from nothing? No. You're converting the kinetic energy, the energy of motion, as these things are flown around the track, so to speak, and then smash them together. So you're converting kinetic energy into matter. So we can convert matter to energy and energy to matter, but you can't get either one from nothing because that violates this law of physics. And this is a very fundamental law. I mean, we see it in the world around us every day. I mean, if you think about this, why do we need to eat food every day? <laughs> Regardless of how difficult that process might sometimes be. Because your body needs energy to operate. It can't get it from nothing because that violates physics. So you have to get it from the chemical energy within the food after you actually get it into your mouth, but that's a different problem. <laughs> Why do you get a bill from the power company every month? Because your appliances need energy to work, can't get it from nothing because that violates physics, so you have to get it from the power company, which also can't get it from nothing because that violates physics. It has to get it from the chemical energy stored in coal or the gravitational potential energy in flowing water or solar energy from the sun, which also can't get it from nothing because that violates physics. It has to burn hydrogen and so on. And there's more examples like this I can give, but I don't want to over, you know, overstress the point. 
But this is a very fundamental principle in physics. Uh, in fact, we couldn't be seeing this presentation tonight if this principle weren't true, if this weren't a law, because some of the principles of circuit design are based on this law of physics. As one of my textbooks says, conservation laws are the guiding principles of physics. These are absolute conservation laws. They are always obeyed. Matter or energy can't come from nothing. So, having stated it that way, you might see some obvious implications for origins there, right? Because where does our universe supposedly come from, according to what we are told is the consensus opinion? Well, the Big Bang happened. The Big Bang came from nothing, supposedly, according to some authors. Well, that's a violation of this law of physics on the largest possible scale. I mean, if I told you this clicker popped into existence right before the talk began from nothing, you would, that's a silly idea, right? But people are saying all the matter and energy in the entire universe popped into existence from nothing. But physics doesn't allow for that. Everything could not have come from nothing. And the Big Bang isn't the only cosmological model that has something coming from nothing, by the way. But the first law actually disproves this entire category of cosmogonies. Cosmogony means history of the cosmos. So this law shows that something could not have come from nothing, so every cosmological model that claims that is dispro disproven and discredited by this law of physics. What about the second law of physics? What implications does, pardon me, second law of thermodynamics, what impl implications does it have for origins? Well, as I mentioned, the second law is sometimes expressed as entropy in a closed system will always increase. So what is entropy? Here's one definition, and this is kind of a mouthful, forgive me for that, but it says entropy change is the measure of how more widely a specific quantity of, mole of molecular energy is dispersed in a process. So in other words, as energy disperses, entropy goes up. Now that doesn't quite tell us what entropy is, we'll talk about that later, but it is a very common aspect of entropy increasing. For example, if you take a piece of firewood and burn it, what happens? While well, you're taking a chunk of stuff, a solid block of chemical energy in a sense, and you're converting it into other, other things. You're converting it into light and heat, kinetic energy, because the air is moving, right? Particulates, i.e. smoke, and a few other things as well. Now, when you're finished with that, you may have a little bit of ash left over. All the rest of that stuff you started with is now dispersed in a much wider area. The air with, within your room may have gotten hotter. Uh, the light went out. Some of that heat will escape uh, into the atmosphere and then be radiated into space. Ultimately, what started out as a small concentration of chemical energy is going to be more broadly dispersed over a much, wide, or much wider area. So this has an important implication. It tells us that hot things cool off. Well, that's a profound statement, Spike. We're so glad we came to your presentation tonight. No, this actually is profound because it has implications for origins. For example, we could use coffee as a crude form of clock. So if you walk into a room and there's a hot cup of coffee on the table, has it been there for a long time or a short time? It's a short time, right? Because had it been there a long time, it would have cooled off already. Can it have been there forever? No, because if it had been there forever, it would have cooled off forever ago, right? Let's apply that same logic to the universe. Is there anything in the universe that's hot and has not cooled off yet? Lots of them, right? If the universe were eternally old, if it had been there forever, stars would have all cooled off and burned out forever ago. But they're still there. That tells us the universe hasn't been there forever, right? Now some people say, wait a minute, new stars can form. There's actually problems with that from a secular perspective, but set those aside for a moment. Star formation still requires energy, of which there's a finite amount available. So if the universe were eternally old, if it had been here forever, new stars would have ceased forming eternally long ago, and stars would have all burned out eternally long ago. And today the universe would all be the same temperature, a few degrees above absolute zero, and there, no life would be possible. But that's not what we see. The universe is not eternally old. It hasn't been here forever because it still has hot stars within it. There are some Christians, by the way, that say we need to embrace the Big Bang model because they say it shows that the universe had a beginning and that's consistent with Genesis and we need that. Well, actually, the Big Bang model is not consistent with Genesis. My point for tonight, though, is we don't need the Big Bang model to show that the universe had a beginning. 
If the universe can't be eternally old, then it must have began at some point, right? So if you want to prove that the universe had a beginning, go outside and look up. Do you see the sun by day? Do you see stars at night? If so, the universe is not eternally old, which means it had a beginning. So, simple exercise. Tomorrow when you go outside, look up if the sun's visible through the clouds. The sun proves that the universe had a beginning. We don't need the Big Bang model for that. So we've talked about the first and second laws, how they work, and some of the implications for origins. Now we're a little bit better equipped to revisit some of those incorrect arguments we talked about before. So I, I believe I spoke about some of this already. The, the people, some people say evolution is impossible because it's a decrease in entropy. Well, as we said, the Earth isn't a closed system. The fact that it's getting energy from the sun means that in theory, as long as the sun had a larger increase in entropy than a smaller decrease on Earth, then thermodynamics is not violated. And again, I'm not saying evolution's possible to, to get from molecules to man, but this is not one of the reasons why, so we shouldn't use incorrect arguments. What about separation of oil and vinegar? Is that a reversal of entropy? No, it actually isn't, because separation is at the lower energy state, and it wants to revert to that. So that is not a problem either. Crystal formation actually comes about as a result of um, the structure of the molecules without going into details. Um, I've kind of pictured as clicking tinker toys together. They're only gonna click together in certain forms. And so when crystals form, they're following a predetermined pattern, if you will. And actually ent ent entropy increases as that process happens. And of course, a baby's growth, although the baby itself is getting more complex, going from a few cells to an entire child, nevertheless, the, the mother's body is consuming energy to do that. Overall entropy in the universe is going up. And so we shouldn't use that argument either. Nor should the other side trying to refute it. What about the fall of man? I mentioned this before, but didn't go into details. Is the curse imposed on the universe as a result of Adam's sin, is this the source of the second law of thermodynamics? Well, the Bible doesn't talk in these terms, but it does give us some clues. And I don't believe that the second law was introduced as a result of the fall. I think it had to be in place even in the Garden of Eden. Why do I say that? Well, the Lord told Adam and Eve to go eat from various trees and presumably plants, right? Well, to digest food, you need the second law of thermodynamics in operation. So if Adam and Eve could digest the food that they were eating, and I'm pretty sure they could, then the second law had to be in operation. We know that they walked in the garden, right? Well, walking requires friction between your feet and the ground. That's actually an increase in entropy. So if Adam and Eve were able to walk, which clearly they could, then the second law was uh, in operation at the time. So what did change then at the fall? Well, I think, and this is just my personal opinion, the Bible doesn't talk in detail about this, I think we can apply things we see elsewhere in Scripture, like when the Israelites were in the wilderness for 40 years and their sandals didn't wear out and their clothes didn't wear out, right? They were still subject to thermodynamics because they got older and eventually died. But this one aspect of it was not in play. The Lord suspended particular effects of thermodynamics uh, in their lives. I believe that the same was true in the Garden of Eden. The second law was, was in place. You know, the laws of physics were the same back then. But the Lord would have miraculously sustained Adam and Eve had they not sinned. Um, and so that the harmful effects of it that we experience today would not have taken place then. Again, Scripture doesn't say this. Uh, you can form your own opinion. I'm just sharing mine. So, we talked about misconceptions. Let's move on. See, we're actually getting through this list, right? <laughs> Let's talk about valid arguments from thermodynamics. We talked about some ones we shouldn't use. I've shared a couple that we can use, and let's apply a few more. First of all, where did life come from? How do you get from non-living chemicals to a living creature? There's actually a lot of thermodynamic issues involved in that, and they all go the wrong way if you're an evolutionist. They all prevent life from forming. And I won't go into detail on this because uh, there's been others who do a much better job. Uh, the Discovery Institute, for example, has done excellent work on this. If you, so if you're really curious and a geeky subject, uh, here you go. Even if life could form, though, that there's other aspects of this that are puzzling if you're an evolutionist who wants to believe it all happened without a creator. For example, amino acids come in two different structures, the L form or left-handed, if you will, and then the D form, the right-handed. 
And it turns out all the proteins in our body, they're all made from amino acids, but all those amino acids are the L form. So why is that important? Because if you mix chemicals together in the laboratory and try to make amino acids, which isn't all that easy, by the way, um, evolutionists have to believe it happened by itself, but if you do allow it just to happen in your little beaker on your lab bench, you're going to get a mixture of both forms. And even if proteins could spontaneously form from amino acids assembling themselves, you're going to get a mixture of both kinds of these in the assembly. But that's not what our bodies contain. For that matter, all life is like this. So you have a problem if you're an evolutionist saying it all happened by itself without any design or interfering in the process because chemistry says that's not how it would happen. And by the way, even if you try to separate out one from the other and try to come up with a story about how that happened in nature billions or millions of years ago, uh, that still won't help you because some of them will spontaneously change to the other form, again, from uh, thermodynamic reasons. So thermodynamics here is saying that life can't form by itself in many reasons, um, including this one. Even with an organism existing, thermodynamics is an issue. For example, DNA is a fairly fragile molecule and will break down over time. Our bodies actually have a lot of repair mechanisms that are always monitoring our DNA and repairing um, problems that arise. But of course, when a creature dies, then there's no repair going on. And that's interesting because this happens fairly quickly. People have measured how quickly DNA breaks down. Uh, the half-life is in the hundreds of years, and it turns out that even if you freeze a tissue sample and seal it off from oxygen, the DNA will still spontaneously break down due to thermodynamic reasons. And after 6.8 million years, uh, no single base pair will remain intact in DNA. In other words, all the DNA will have broken up after 6.8 million years. Well, that's interesting because dinosaurs supposedly died out almost 10 times longer in the past, 65 million years, which means dinosaur DNA should have all been gone almost 60 million years ago. Yet there's still evidence for it in some dinosaur fossils today. Not very big pieces, but there shouldn't be any pieces. Like I said, every single base pair should have been broken after, uh, as of 60 million years ago. But it's still there today. Well, that would seem to imply that they're not actually 65 million years old. And similar arguments can be applied in other discoveries in dinosaur fossils. And I'm sure some of you have seen this, but perhaps some of you haven't, so I'll visit this for a moment. This is the Hell Creek Formation in Montana, which has a lot of dinosaur fossils within it. And a few years back, a paleontologist named Dr. Mary Schweitzer was excavating a Tyrannosaur femur bone. Saw something unusual in the bone, brought it back to the lab, dissolved away the outer matrix, and inside of this Tyrannosaur leg bone, is soft, stretchy tissue. Does that look 65 million years old to you? Within that, there's blood vessels and blood cells. Dinosaur blood in the laboratory. Now, if you've seen a cre creation presentation before, then good chance you've already seen this, but there's other discoveries going on since then. There's actually a lot of soft tissue in dinosaur fossils. It's been there the whole time, but nobody was looking for it. Uh, more recent discoveries you might not be as familiar with, for example, uh, Mark Armitage has been working with Triceratops bone and finding, among other things, nerve tissue. After 65 million years, there's still nerve tissue left. Surrounded by this mesh, you see this crosshatch pattern, a mesh of collagen, which also breaks down quickly. And under the microscope, there's more interesting stuff going on. Notice this bone has a lot of pores in it. Turns out a lot of these pores have this black material that's coagulated blood. And there's evidence that this is uh, apparent evidence for the creature having drowned. Um, there's a specific effect, I forget the name of it, but when an animal drowns, there's this chemical cascade of stuff that goes on and it's blood clots in a certain way. Apparently that's what this triceratops did. Of course that implies a flood of some kind. But interesting too, um, this bone was excavated a little differently than is typical. Normally someone will wrap a bone in plaster to protect it and bring it back to the lab and so on. Um, this one was sprayed with fixative immediately because they wanted to see uh, what might be there that would otherwise be lost. And it turns out that inside of this allegedly 65 million year old bone, actually a bit more than 65, there is worms, nematodes, eating 
the coagulated blood. 65 million years old? Doesn't look that way. Lots more we could talk about with this, but we're getting off of my topic. So let's go back to thermodynamics specifically and apply it to other areas such as cosmology. What does thermodynamics tell us about this? Well, this raises a question which I like to call the secular dilemma. It's a simple question, just six words. Did the universe have a beginning? How many possible answers are there to that question? Just two, either yes or no, right? Either yes, the universe had a beginning, or no, there was not a beginning, which means it's been there forever, it's eternal. There never was a beginning to it. Why do I call this a dilemma? Well, a dilemma is a choice between equally unfavorable alternatives. You have to make a choice, but you don't want to choose any of them because they're all bad. For the secular scientist, this is a dilemma because both of these answers, and we just agree that there's only two possible ones to pick from, both of these answers violate the laws of thermodynamics in different ways. For example, let's say you want to answer yes to this question. The universe had a beginning according to your model, and the Big Bang is, is uh, in this category of models, by the way. So if the universe had a beginning, well, the universe is everything. So if everything had a beginning, what was there before the beginning? Well, there had to be nothing, right? Because if there was something before the beginning, then whatever began wasn't everything, right? <laughs> so if everything began, then before that beginning, there was nothing. So here's a picture of what the universe looked like before the Big Bang. <laughs> That's nothing. Of course, I took some liberties, because that's just an artist's conception. <laughs> but does this make sense? Can you go from nothing to everything? Can nothing make anything? No, because nothing can create nothing. Nothing can do nothing. From nothing comes nothing. As Dr. R.C. Sproul once said, if there were ever once truly nothing, there could never be anything, which I thought was kind of profound. And as Dr. Phil Fernandez once said, you can't tell me nothing made everything. I know too much about nothing. <laughs> so, so far, that sounds more like a philosophical argument. But hopefully by now, having been equipped from the earlier part of the talk, we know that there's a law of physics that says this specifically. <clears throat> Excuse me. The first law of thermodynamics, right? Mass and energy are conserved. You can't make something from nothing, which means something could not have come from nothing and that something would include the universe. Now, if you're familiar with this subject, you may be aware that some atheists would object to that claim. I mean, this entire book claims to explain how a universe could come from nothing. Uh, I won't time to talk about this now. The claim is incorrect. Uh, if you want more detail, we can uh, just raise it during Q&A. For now, I'll just assume that it's obvious that something can't come from nothing because of that law of thermodynamics that we discussed. So we see that of these two choices, of these two possible answers for the secular dilemma, yes is not an option because it violates the first law of thermodynamics. What about the second answer? What about no? Well, earlier we talked about the second law of thermodynamics, which says the universe can't be eternal. It had to have a beginning, right? And we know that because heat is still unevenly distributed. There's still hot stuff in cold space. There's still stars. They're all still there. So as we talked about, this reminds us that the universe had a beginning which means it's not eternal. Now, again, there are some atheist claims that it is eternal, that there's this oscillating universe where there's a bang which expands and then slows down and contracts into a crunch and then it rebounds and the bang, crunch, bang, crunch, bang, crunch, goes on forever. That doesn't work either. Again, during Q&A, you can bring that up if you want more details. For now, I will just note that we know from the second law of thermodynamics that the universe is not eternal, so that option is not available to the secular modeler either. And those are the only two choices he has. I mean, we all agreed those are the only two options available, right? Each one violates thermodynamics in a different way. So the secular, mod <coughs> excuse me, secular modeler doesn't get to have a model that's consistent with all the physics. His only option is which law of physics he has to violate in his model. As Christians, we have a third option. A supernatural creator is the only explanation that doesn't violate physics. Yes, we know the universe had a beginning because we see stars that hasn't been here forever, but that beginning was instituted by a creator outside of the universe, outside of physics. Because if you think about it, there's only three possibilities for why the universe exists anyway. Either it was formed by a creator or it formed without a creator, 
or it didn't form at all because it's always existed. We saw that option two violates the first law of thermodynamics. Option three violates the second law of thermodynamics, which means the only option left is that it was formed by a creator. So thermodynamics means that atheistic cosmogonies, atheistic histories of the universe, are not allowed. They will all violate physics in one way or the other. And this is a great conversation starter, by the way. Simple question, did the universe have a beginning? Just six words. Ask someone that, see what they answer, and then you can explore the ramifications of what their answer was, and hopefully bring them to realize that physics does not allow secular origin for everything. But this is more than just a witnessing tool. I view this also as evidence of God's grace. The universe looks created because the laws according to which it operates also show that a supernatural creator has to be responsible for it all. And the Lord didn't have to make the universe this way, if you think about it. I mean, he could have made the universe look any way he wanted. He's omnipotent, right? So he could have made a universe that had a potential explanation from naturalistic processes. And he could have told us in his word, don't pay attention to that. Trust me, I made this quite recently. He would have been within his right to do that. But how many of us would struggle in that situation with what science seemed to, to be showing versus what the Bible says? Well, we don't have to struggle because in his grace, the Lord has placed us in a universe that looks created. I think that's wonderful. So we talked about some valid applications for thermodynamics. Let's revisit the laws briefly and find out why they work the way they do. And again, this reflects later de developments in science now. And we'll see some additional implications for origins from that. So for example, why does, it seems clear as to why the first law would work. You can't get something from nothing. I mean, we have everyday experience with that. But why does entropy increase? Why does the second law of thermodynamics work? Well, this goes back to the work of Ludwig Boltzmann, who passed away in the early 1900s. So uh, that gives you an idea of when all this was first discovered. And without going into entropy itself, which is, can get rather technical, I'm going to try to express this with a few practical examples. And for example, playing cards. You have a deck of cards, 52 cards. We took the jokers out, right? So there's 52 cards. How many possible arrangements are there for 52 cards? Turns out there's eight times 10 to the 67 possible ways to arrange a deck of cards. That, that's a whole lot, right? Now, when it comes from the factory, the deck of cards is arranged ace, king of hearts, ace, king of clubs, king, ace of diamonds, king, ace of spades. So this is the factory sequence. But if you have a shuffled deck of cards, it's all thoroughly mixed together, and you shuffle it at random, are you ever going to get this order back? Everyone says no. Why not? Because there's one arrangement where it matches the original sequence, and every other arrangement does not, and every other arrangement is eight followed by all those zeros. So your odds of arriving back at that order is one out of this ridiculously long number. On the other hand, your odds are that ridiculous, ridiculously long number to one that you're going to arrive at some other order, which is our experience. That's what always happens, right? So this is, in a sense, entropy at work. Even when you start from a system with a whoops, specific sequence or specific order, quote unquote, you're going to wind up with a system that is not in that initial configuration because all the other ways it could be far, far, far outnumber the specific one we're talking about. So this is a little bit oversimplified, but here's a way to think about entropy. Entropy represents the probability of having a distinct arrangement of a system. Like all of those 10 to the 67 ways you can arrange cards, each one is a unique sequence, so it's not a matter of uniqueness, but there's only one in which there's the original sequence there, whereas all of the others of that extremely large number are kind of the same in that they are not representative of that order. So do you see what's going on here? The entropy you know, is increasing simply because all of the ways to have a quote unquote disordered system far, far, far outnumber the ways in which you can have the quote unquote ordered one. Now that, hopefully that is a little bit, um, that's you know, kind of an everyday example. When you look at physics, it's a little bit less intuitive, but for example, why heat will distribute itself, why a cup of coffee distributes its heat into the room instead of sucking heat out of the room, and so icicles are dripping off the ceiling while the coffee boils. That's because if you look mathematically at the number of possible arrangements of heat within a room, 
the arrangements where the heat is evenly distributed far, far, far outnumber the way that the number of arrangements where they're all concentrated in a small region. So I don't know if that made sense, but the same underlying principles apply. And this also explains the apparent association between entropy and disorganization. We already said disorganization is not a quantifiable and measurable value. Well, this gets back to our, us imposing a subjective experience, if you will, on this underlying math of possible arrangements. Like if you have even only 20 items in your garage, there's still 2.4 quintillion possible ways to arrange it. Like if there's 20 items and 20 places to put an item, 2.4 quintillion ways to arrange it. It's 20 factorial. So if stuff moves around at random, you got one out of 2.4 quintillion chances of getting it all right, quote unquote right. That's why it winds up being messy because there's so many more ways for it to be messy than for it to be in perfect order. Again, not that disorder is the equivalent of entropy, but that's how we perceive it. It's just the mathematics of how the arrangements work. And I'll also note too, you can go into a messy garage and organize it again. Are you reversing entropy? Are you violating thermodynamics? Well, there's two things going on here. Number one, you're not moving stuff at random. You're an intelligent designer interfering in the system, right? And number two, you're burning calories in your muscles, glucose in your brain, uh, you're moving around creating friction. You're creating a larger entropy in the universe than whatever smaller reversal you might be doing in the items. So this gets back to the idea about evolution being impossible because it's an open system, right? You could say, well, uh, never mind, I won't go into that now. But hopefully you understand the point here. Entropy is simply a result of the amount of possible arrangements of the components of a system. Okay, so what is the point spike by this point you're wondering? You can calculate, <laughs> the point is that we can calculate the probability of different arrangements of matter and energy based on how all this works. And it turns out that a low entropy system is less probable than a high entropy system, like we saw with the playing cards. The number of ways to arrange it so that it matches the factory sequence is far, far, far less probable than an arrangement where it doesn't match the factory sequence, which is why it always gravitates, if you will, toward the more probable arrangement. So if you apply the same underlying mathematics to the matter and energy distribution in the overall universe today, which of these two options do you think it is? Is the universe low entropy or high entropy? Turns out it's very low. So the universe is in a very improbable configuration of matter and energy. And if you think about it, if the entropy is low today, and the universe is supposed to be 14 billion years old, and entropy is supposed to continually increase over time, if it's been increasing for 14 billion years and it's still low today, it was far, far, far lower back in the Big Bang, alleged, allegedly happened. And we just saw that ent low entropy means a less probable configuration of the system. That means the fact that the universe had to be much lower entropy in the past, that the Big Bang universe, even if the Big Bang actually happened, and there's a lot of reasons that, that why that model is wrong, but even if you believe that it, it's correct, the universe that was brought into existence by the Big Bang had to be in an extremely improbable arrangement of matter and energy. How improbable? Well, I'm not going to quote numbers, but there's an interesting illustration of just how improbable it had to be. Even if something could create itself from nothing, you know, let's say the universe popped into existence. That's a silly idea, but there are secular scientists who want to believe that. Even if that were actually possible, the universe that we see is extremely unlikely to be the result of that because it had to be this random event without a designer involved, right? Let me give you an analogy of this, and this will seem strange, but give me a moment, you'll see where I'm going with this. Let's say you have a friend who says, you know, I figured out where Washington, D.C. came from. You say, well, we know where it came from. People built it over the past couple centuries. No, no, no. My model says the universe, uh, the city, excuse me, popped into existence from nothing. And you say, that's a ridiculous idea. No, no, this is a good model. It's sound scientifically. There's lots of evidence for it. And so you're trying to think of a way to illustrate to your friend that this is a ridiculous idea. You say, well, that is so unlikely to have happened, even if something could come into existence from nothing. 
it is actually far more likely that something smaller popped into existence, say the de Declaration of Independence, complete with you know, the, the, the paper or the parchment, whatever it is, and all the ink and all the signatures and all the rest of it. That's still a silly idea, but the Declaration of Independence popping into existence from nothing is still far more probable than the entire city of Washington, D.C., which contains the Declaration and people and buildings and all the rest of it, right? So this is still a silly idea, but it's still far more probable than the entire city of D.C. popping into existence. Everyone still, I know that's a strange thing, but hopefully you're still with me. So what, why did I bring this up? Well, the same logic applies to the universe according to the Big Bang model. The Big Bang universe is so improbable that something else is far more probable. It's far more probable that instead of a universe popping into existence, that it was only a single brain that popped into existence. This is called the Boltzmann brain paradox. Basically, it says that there was something popping into existence from nothing, but it wasn't a universe. Instead, it was only your brain out there in the void. Now you say, wait a minute, that's silly. I'm not just a brain, I have a body, we're in this room. No, 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 your brain had to pop into existence with all the molecules arranged somehow. They just happen to be arranged in such a way where you have false memories built into it of your life lived up to today and memories of walking in this room or whatever. Because you actually just popped into existence a few seconds ago. And this whole thing you're experiencing is actually an illusion because why would you trust your senses anyway? Strange idea, but this is actually what the Big Bang model says. As this article points out, it could be the weirdest and most embarrassing prediction in the history of cosmology, if not science itself. If true, it would, it would mean that you yourself are more likely to be some momentary fluctuation in a field of matter and energy out in space than a person with a real past in an orderly star-spangled cosmos. Your memories and the world you think you see around you are illusions. This bizarre picture is the outcome of a recent series of calculations that take some of the bedrock theories and discoveries of modern cosmology to the limit. The basic problem is that it's hard for nature to make a whole universe. It's much easier to make fragments of one, like planets, yourself maybe in a spacesuit, or even, in the most absurd and troubling example, a naked brain floating in space. Nature tends to do what's easiest from the standpoint of energy and probability, and so these fragments, in particular the brains, would appear far more frequently than real full-fledged universes, or than us, or they might be us. Alan Guth, a cosmologist at MIT, who's a rock star among cosmologists, by the way, pointed out that some calculations result in an infinite number of free-floating brains for every normal brain, making it, quote, these are his words, infinitely unlikely for us to be normal brains. This is what their models actually say. So, back to the analogy. To illustrate how ridiculous it is for an entire city to pop into existence, you can illustrate that by saying it's much more likely less ridiculous for just the Declaration of Independence to pop into existence. It's still not going to happen, clearly, but it's less silly than the original idea, right? And this comes from thermodynamics, just pr the probability of arrangement of matter and energy. Well, the same math applies to the Big Bang universe. Thermodynamics shows us that even if, it, if something popped into existence from nothing, the arrangement of matter and energy necessary in the Big Bang model was so improbable that it's far more probable that only a single brain popped into existence, which is what you are according to this model, according to what the math says. As I said, this is called the Boltzmann brain paradox. And just to clarify, this is not saying that you are a naked brain floating in space because there is no space. It's just you. <laughs> now I know what you're thinking. And the answer to your question is no. No, Spike is not making this stuff up. This actually is what cosmological models predict. As this paper said, a typical observer in the multiverse is a Boltzmann brain. In the eternally inflating vacua, observers are infinitely more likely to be Boltzmann brains than honest folk like ourselves. This paper says, the most likely fluctuation consistent with everything you know is simply your brain, complete with quote unquote memories, fluctuating briefly out of chaos and then immediately equilibrating back into chaos again. This is sometimes called the Boltzmann brain paradox. This author was writing, was trying to avoid Boltzmann brain domination in holographic dark energy models. This author published a note on Boltzmann brains. Sinks in the landscape, Boltzmann brains and the cosmological constant problem. 
Can the Higgs boson save us from the menace of the Boltzmann brains? Boltzmann brains in the scale factor cutoff measure of the multiverse, etc. Now, a few years back, some people thought they had finally solved this problem. It turns out, though, on further examination, they did not. As this author wrote his paper, The Return of the Boltzmann Brains. Now, who heard about this the last time you saw a science TV show or went to a museum or read a textbook? Probably not, right? <laughs> I had to dig deep into the cosmological literature to find these papers. They don't like talking about this. I mean, would you, <laughs> if that's what your model said? Because what does secular cosmology actually predict? When you take it to its logical conclusion and apply thermodynamics and probability to it, it doesn't predict a universe. It just predicts one brain. <laughs> now think about this. What does this actually mean anyway? The Big Bang model says, when take us to its logical conclusion, which secular scientists are reluctant to do for obvious reasons, the Big Bang model says you're just a Boltzmann brain, which means there is no universe and if there's no universe, there never was a Big Bang. So the Big Bang model says the Big Bang didn't happen. The model disproves itself. So there are claims from secular folks who, that science gives, us, gives them great weapons to disprove the Bible with, but in reality, the only weapon that science gives them is this one. <laughs> okay. So we talked about implications for origins. Briefly reviewing everything we've talked about, we talked about some incorrect arguments. Hopefully it's clear uh, by now why we shouldn't be using these. We talked about the idea that, uh, that the second law might have come into existence with the fall of man, and I presented some reasons against that. We talked about incorrect applications of just saying that entropy, require, uh, entropy reflects an increase in disorder, and why that's not quite correct. We often perceive it that way, but that's not what's happening under the cover, so to speak. Then we talked about valid ways to use thermodynamics. We talked about the first law, that you can't get something from nothing. The second law, that hot things will cool off. We talked about applications in the solar system, showing that these things are apparently much younger than is often claimed. We talked about why life could not have formed by itself, why the many things that are claimed to be old are not, why there's evidence for these things actually being young. And we talked about applying thermodynamic principles to the entire universe, according to the Big Bang model, showing that the math says you're actually just a brain floating in the void. And I think it's interesting that all of this derived from the Industrial Revolution and the desire of some governments to match the economic output of Great Britain. In a sense, all of this started with a desire to make more money. <laughs> but what started with commercial intent actually reveals a lot of truths about our origins. And if you take anything away from the talk tonight, I saved this one for last because I want to emphasize it. The secular dilemma is a great way to apply some of these ideas to conversations to get people thinking. Like I said, did the universe have a beginning? Simple question, only two possible answers. People get that and then help them explore the ramifications of that. And you might get some people who are willing to talk more about origins with you. Not everybody will be engaged with this question. I mean, different people have different interests, but some people will be. I mean, it worked on me. <laughs> this question is what started me in this whole path of questioning my atheism and evolutionism. And here I am talking about a position that I tried to disprove for almost a year. So interesting irony in that. But indeed, thermodynamics does confirm creation. As Ken mentioned, I have a website, creationastronomy.com, that talks about this kind of stuff. There's a free email newsletter there, a form on every page. Uh, only comes out a few times a year, but as interesting things happen in astronomy or physics or whatever. Um, as you can tell, there's a rather unusual perspective being presented here, so that's what this newsletter is for. In the back, there's a three DVD series on astronomy specifically. Uh, the first volume in that goes planet by planet through the solar system. You heard just a brief mention of some of this tonight, but the full presentation digs deeper into each planet and many of the major moons of the solar system. Talks about where they came from. Could they have come from a cloud of gas billions of years ago? The answer is no. There's many reasons why that doesn't work. Lots of evidence for youth, even beyond that which I've already discussed. Results from recent missions, how they contradict some secular models. Look at just the beauty and unbelievable splendor of many of these things. I like very visual presentations, if you haven't gathered by now. So this, this is over two hours, over 500 images of all these various things. We talked about Pluto on that. 
In fact, there's so much material on that one, it is now a two-disc set. Uh, if you bought this, by the way, and it's only a one-disc presentation, um, then you might want to consider upgrading because there's an additional more than half hour of material on the latest edition, which came out last year. Uh, stuff that wasn't uh, current yet at the time of the previous edition was published. Volume two in that series talks about stars and galaxies, including our sun. Is there evidence for design in our sun? Yes, there is. Can stars have form on, formed on their own billions of years ago? Uh, the first generation of stars actually creates a lot of problems for secular modelers. Similar with formation of galaxies. What does the scale and size of the cosmos tell us about our creator? That's volume two. Volume three talks about the origin of the universe itself. Is there evidence for a big bang? It goes a lot more into detail uh, about that question than I had time to tonight. Big bang model turns out to be very bad science. The Boltzmann brain thing we talked about was just one aspect of that. There's lots of evidence for design in the universe. Secular scientists try to explain that away with the multiverse, that there's an infinite number of universes. And lately, the most popular thing is the suggestion that the universe looks designed because we actually live in a computer simulation being run on computers of aliens. So that's covered in that DVD as well. And then it finishes with the Boltzmann brains that we talked about this evening. So those are available in DVDs. It's also available on my website in digital form, if that's the form you prefer. And all of this is consistent with this proclamation that the heavens do indeed declare the glory of God, not the Big Bang. And I thank you very much for your attention this evening. Thank you again.